Okay. Welcome, everyone, to uh, Decrypting the Living Room. Um, this, like Kevin said, this is an update of a presentation I gave at TechCon. I also gave it uh, internally at Kaler U um, a couple weeks ago, and this stuff is always changing. So that's part of the reason why I have a date on here, so that if somebody watches this three months, six months out, they'll know some of the uh, information in here is probably already outdated. Um, but this is the, the best we have right now, and um, we're also going to be talking about some trends and stuff, which, you know, don't really change that quickly, but... So, welcome to Decrypting the Living Room. So, we're going to start out with, uh, what's in a living room? Here's a fairly common living room, right? Couple constants in a common living room. A 40-inch or larger HDTV. And uh, sorry, I should be really specific. We're talking um, largely about the U.S. here. So, when I'm not specific about what we're talking about, um, I'm talking about the United States. The data is largely specific to the United States. Um, so 40 inch or larger HDTV, and you sit about nine feet away from it. Um, that nine feet is actually pretty constant between the U.S. Uh, and Europe. Europe sits a tiny bit far, farther away. I think it's like 9.8 feet, um, but functionally about the same. There's also a bunch of variables uh, in a living room. Variables like cable boxes, streaming devices, gaming systems, sound systems, all kinds of other stuff in addition to those constants. So while there is sort of a baseline that we can target in people's living rooms, there's also a lot of variability once you get outside of that, um, those, those couple baseline constants. So let's talk about the biggest, I guess, tech, I mean, you might have a couch that's bigger than your TV probably, but you know, the biggest technological baseline constant, which is the television. It's a viewing distance chart. Everybody loves these. Um, so this chart is a 60 PPD uh, pixels per degree viewing distance chart. This is basically, this is based on um, the same science that's behind the eye chart at your eye doctor, basically the, the you know, the E chart. Um, we can, a person with 20-20 vision can resolve about 60 pixels uh, per degree, which is a measurement that takes, takes into account um, both distance and resolution. Um, so based on that measurement of the human eye, this chart shows you where um, the differences between the different video resolutions become noticeable. And you can kind of see that if you line up where the, uh, the nine foot mark is, you know, you can kind of carry it over to 4K and you start getting into fairly big uh, TV sizes pretty quick. Now, there was some uh, work done by NHK out of Japan. Um, a few years, I want to say two or three years ago, uh, working in 4K and 8K and seeing um, what people could actually actually discern and what they were feeling about the content. And their research indicated that even though there might be physical limits, like with rods and cones and that kind of stuff in our eyes, we can, because we have amazing brains and do a lot of processing in those brains, we can actually... Uh, at a functional level resolve a lot higher than that 60 ppd so here's a viewing distance chart based on uh, the results of the nhk work which indicate about 200 uh, pixels per degree and so now you get into some really 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 big uh, screen sizes here once you you know carry across the viewing distance of about nine feet and what does that tell us uh, in an average living room with a nine foot viewing distance your 4k tv should be 146 inches diagonal um, I know all of you are just uh, really excited about putting a 146 inch TV. Maybe some of you actually are, um, but most of us that would um, be fairly ridiculous in our living rooms. So the moral of this whole viewing chart story is ignore viewing distance charts. They are for presentations and form arguments. They are not for real work. What we really want to talk about is actual viewer behavior, what humans actually do in the real world, and then target our efforts and uh, shape our efforts around real human behavior and not just, you know, charts and forums. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so here's real viewer behavior. Real viewer, viewer behavior, again, in America, is buy as big a TV as I can, sit about nine feet away from it, and buy a new TV roughly every five years, but this number is shrinking, and we'll kind of get a little bit into that in a, in a bit. Um, but that is what real people do in the real world. Yep. I lost my focus on the thing. There we go. All right. So TV households, according to Nielsen, there's about 118 million, a little more TV households in America. And this is an interesting trend graph because it gets towards uh, buying a new TV um, every roughly five years and cycling the old TV um, into another room. So 
you can see 1997, one or two TVs, almost 70% of people had one or two TVs, not as many had three or more TVs. But then you see the number of three or more TVs rising 2001, 2005, 2009. As people are buying new TVs, they're cycling the old TVs into their second rooms or third rooms or wherever, you know, kitchen, playroom, whatever. Now we're starting to see that trend flip. You can see 2009 to 2015, people are buying, they're still buying new TVs. People are always buying new TVs, but they're not as often going to be cycling those old TVs into other rooms of the house. Couple reasons for that. Number one, TVs just don't last as long. You have T, you have uh, circuit boards that are a lot more dense, they're a lot more prone to heat failure, a lot less able to be repaired. Uh, you also have the obvious rise of mobile devices. So everybody's got a screen already. Everybody's got a screen in their pocket. They've got tablets. They've got laptops. That kind of stuff. So there's less of a need to have a screen on a dresser or in a wall uh, in every room because a lot of people are carrying screens around nowadays. So what do people actually have? And this is this data is a little old, but I like this chart better. So I have a little newer data on a uh, less pretty chart in a second. Um, but I like the way this this uh, makes it look. So you can kind of see 94% um, of households uh, have HDTV, have an HDTV. HDTV is very important to this conversation. So if you are still running SD channels in 4.3, you are not properly targeting your audience at this point in time. Most people, most people, most in bold, have an HDTV as their primary TV. That's what we should be targeting. So if you've got SD channels, you should really be thinking about and working towards uh, getting them to a 16.9 aspect ratio, native 16.9. Um, also got smartphones, obviously over 80%. That's, that's a pretty obvious thing. Um, we all have seen the rise of mobile um, everywhere. DVD players, VOD, uh, DVR, SVOD, uh, game consoles, 44%. I'll talk about game consoles a bit later on. Um, enabled smart TV. So there's two big takeaways from here. One is that HDTV thing I just mentioned, but also this enabled smart TV thing. This is a very, very American specific thing. And this is a very new thing. In the past, Americans have not enabled smart TVs. We buy them, but we were not plugging them in. We were not uh, connecting them to the internet. And we were not using the smart features. Few reasons, our broadcasts were not really smart enabled, so we didn't really have much to do there on the over the air stuff. Um, we also, the TVs themselves were kind of terrible. The apps they had were terrible, the operating systems were terrible, and they um, were not a great user experience versus using something like a Roku or an Apple TV. But that's changing, and so we're seeing this enabled smart TV thing 43% year over year growth um, from Q1 2016 uh, to Q, or sorry, from Q1 2015 to Q1 2016. That's huge growth, and that's going to be a huge thing going forward for a couple reasons that I'll get to in a bit. Um, here's more recent data. So this is Q4 2016. So now we're comparing a little more recently. This is the Nielsen Total Audience Report does a really good job of pulling these overall numbers. Um, so you can see there's the HDTV number and there's the enabled smart, uh, <coughs> excuse me, smart TV number. Uh, now it's at 35% year over year growth. So that growth is slowing a bit because as you get everybody enabling it, eventually that year over year growth is going to slow down because you're going to get everybody with their smart TVs plugged in. So remember when I said everybody's got smartphones? So the average number of screens in a house is 7.3 screens. And that's a mix of TVs, smartphones, laptops, tablets, and then you get down into desktop computers, video game consoles, um, that kind of stuff. So obviously some of those don't have screens, so we're kind of aggregating two types of devices, but the average number of screens, um, sorry, they are including video game consoles. That's a little weird. So data is a little skewed. So this is actually a really good um, example of why you have to look at all the data and only and not only look at parts of the data because the way they're doing some of this data some some studies are capturing things that other studies are not and we'll get into that a little more when we talk about ott and streaming devices um, but it's very it's a very particular methodology that they use and depending on the questions they ask you may have an audience member say no to the same question that they might have said yes to on a different study. Um, so the numbers can be a little off study to study to study, depending on how those studies were conducted. So I have a few little TV tidbits uh, that I couldn't really fit anywhere else, so I just kind of put them on this slide. 
TV manufacturers are starting to drop tuners. Um, that's a little less terrifying than it sounds, um, which I'll, I'll, why I'll get into in a bit. Um, but be aware that not everything that you think is a TV is really a TV. Technically, you can't call it a TV. It doesn't have a tuner. It has to be called a display or a monitor. Or they've, you know, they've got, the FTC's got words for it. Um, but be aware that some TV manufacturers, traditional TV manufacturers are starting to drop tuners. People also don't just watch TV, they're on phones. Over 85% of internet users surf the web while watching TV. If you have watched TV recently, I can't imagine this is a surprise to you. Um, I know me and my wife are always on our phones or on our laptops while we're watching TV. TVs also have some pretty severe security issues that we need to address. Um, those are links, and if you download the PDF that Kevin's going to uh, put up at the end of this thing, uh, you can see a couple different uh, proof-of-concept attacks on smart TVs. One of them is an over-the-air attack targeting the IP layer um, called HBB TV, which is currently in use in Europe, but is going to be uh, in incorporated into ATSC3. So it is something that we in America are going to have to deal with very quickly because in the past, we haven't really had to deal with... Um, issues of security around signal source like a tv like when you're tuning to a tv channel right if your tv finds the a correctly encoded modulated signal at a certain frequency it accepts it as valid and displays it right that's the the sum total of validation that we do right now because that's all we need to do once there's an ip layer to that think about that we're validating source by basically is it there yes it's there accept it give it full access then it's got access into a TV, it's got an IP layer, it's got a command layer, into a TV that, as you saw in the past slides, is now being connected to your home network, to your router, to your other devices on the network, behind your router, behind your firewall, um, and that connection has not come through your firewall, it's come through the over-the-air broadcast. So that, while it's a difficult uh, attack mechanism to exploit, it's a terrifying attack mechanism to be to me because if it's not mitigated upstream at the broadcasters and uh, at those of us providing the content the ip layer and all that there's very little to nothing that the consumer can do to mitigate that attack vector um, so that one is very scary to me there are also security issues with the operating systems of the tvs themselves uh, like the sam i think it's samsung that has the tizen operating system anyway i can't really click the link while you guys are watching um, but the operating systems themselves tend to be not the most secure operating systems that are running on these TVs. And this is a problem we see with pretty much all Internet of Things devices. Um, but again, TVs, everybody's got a TV. 94% of people have TVs. So if you've got an attack vector that, that big, if you've got a, a footprint that big, that's a pretty um, appealing target to somebody who wants to target consumers. So there are things that we're going to have to deal with as an industry that we haven't had to deal with traditionally, and it's going to be a, a difficult road for us over the next, you know, three to five years. Oh yeah, consumer marketing. Um, so in consumer marketing, words don't generally mean what they mean. Um, the example I give is 4K. 4K is used all over the place in consumer marketing, but it doesn't actually mean what they're saying it means. So when you get a 4K TV, most 4K TVs are not 4096 by 2160, which is true technical 4K. They're UHD TVs, which is 3840 by 2160. Um, but 4K is something that consumers understand and something that marketers can throw out there. And it's got, you know, it's the hot term right now, right? So it's just something we're going to have to deal with and be aware that on the consumer side, those words are not the same words that we're using on the professional side to talk about what we do professionally. Um, sort of same thing with HDR. HDR on the consumer side, more often than not, includes wide color gamut. On the pro side, we largely talk about them separately. Um, also something to be aware of. And in consumer marketing, a lot of it just makes no damn sense. So here's a random sample of consumer marketing stuff. Uh, LG is really good at just adding words or changing words for things that already have words. So we have things like HDR Pro, HDR Super Plus Dolby Vision, which I think is just Dolby Vision with more words. Um, you have stuff like Super UHD, which um, is is very gets down to a specificity of it's not really a standard, but oh, it can display this color gamut and this nitpeak brightness, neither of which really carry along to being a true standard. Um, HDR 1000, again, also not a true standard. It's just a peak brightness thing. Uh, and then you get into some of the older stuff. Um, HDR premium, it's important to note that some of these things like HDR premium 
mean that a TV can accept a certain signal of a certain quality, but it may not be able to uh, display it properly in the panel. So it can accept, say, a 10-bit signal mastered to 1,000 nits or 10,000 nits or whatever, but it's not actually going to display it. You know, it's going to have to dither it down to 8-bit or it's going to have to, you know, do a transform function to scale it down in brightness or, or you know, something like that. Um, Ultra HD Premium does actually kind of mean something. Um, it's a certification by the UHD Alliance. It's kind of the closest to a standard of these random things, um, you know, versus the actual standards, which we'll get to in a sec. Uh, and then there's these bottom ones, these 2015 buzzwords that it was a, it was a weird time and I'm glad we're through it because all this stuff was crazy. And here's a UHD trash can to really just drive home that that words kind of just don't matter. Um, I would also like to point out that this UHD trash can only has one star. So before we move into connections, this is one of those points that Kevin mentioned, good point to stop. So I just threw a bunch of stuff at you about TVs and about devices in the living room, um, overall adoption and stuff like that. Does anyone have any questions on any of that stuff or anything you want me to address that I haven't? We, we do have a couple things in there. Um, Chris, the first the first question is, which 4K TV is best on the current market and what specs should we consumers ask about at big box stores? Oh, yeah. So first, don't ask at big box stores um, because they, a lot of them work on commission and a lot of them, you know, I hate for this to be a, a bad mouth of big box stores, but it is, it's a business model designed to sell you something versus a business model designed to educate you, right? So it's better to go online and do your re research. There's a site called Artings, RT, you know, ratings, but RTINGS.com that does very technical reviews of TVs that, um, and they do the same measurements on every TV. So it's very easy to compare TV to TV to TV. Um, there's some others that do it. I think CNET's got a group that does it. Um, look for those, look for sites that are doing the same repeatable high level technical testing of TVs. Um, beyond that, there's really no one best TV, right? You want to generally, you want to buy as big as possible. Um, there are two different backlighting mechanisms, um, LED and OLED, which I think I get to in a bit, but whatever, we'll skip to it now because um, it got asked. Um, OLED, you do get the same very wide contrast ratio. You get that dynamic range, but the peak brightness is lower. So if you're in a, a uh, really bright room, really sunny room, you're probably going to be better served by an LED TV than an OLED TV, uh, just because that peak brightness doesn't get high enough yet. The tech isn't there yet to really drown out really sunny rooms. Um, beyond that, it's, you know, it's one of those what can you afford, right? It's do the research, figure out what's the best. The best is really expensive. Still, it's coming down, but it's still pretty expensive. So see what you can afford. And if you can time it, there are good times to buy. Memorial Day is pretty good. July 4th is pretty good. Black Friday actually last year was the best time to buy a TV and probably will be the same this year. So if you need, if you really feel like you're ready 4K HDR this year, I would say do your research leading up to Black Friday and then just watch and wait and try to, you know, snipe that TV that you've decided is the one you want for a, you know, significant discount. We got anything else on questions? I was muted. Sorry. Uh, yep, what, was no the website, what was the website again? I'll throw it out into the chat window. Yeah. Artings, R-T-I-N-G-S dot com. Basically ratings without the A. Okay, cool. Yeah, there you go. Um, next They're question, out of Canada. I, they do good I work. I think I might be able to answer this one, but I will leave it to you because you're the expert. Uh, do smart TVs have to be hardline connected to my <laughs> modem? No, they, most of them nowadays either have Wi-Fi built in, that's the most common and that's the most common you're going to see, um, or they have the ability to add a USB Wi-Fi dongle, which sometimes they're super specific and you got to buy their version and it's a little more expensive. Um, but nowadays, nowadays, almost every uh, current TV has got some wireless mechanism uh, to connect to the internet. Okay. Um couple more are 2k tvs a thing i should avoid 2k was that weird that weird period where it was um we hadn't gone 4k yet but they kind of needed something to sell the tvs um i don't know that it's something to avoid i just think it's something we're going to see less of as the years go on you know every new tv 
is largely going to be a 4K TV. So you're not even going to be able to buy lower than a 4K TV in probably a year, year and a half in terms of a new TV. Um, obviously, previous model years will still be available and still be discounted. Um, but again, it's kind of up to you. You know, there are use cases in which a 720p TV is still fine. You know, it's really there. Are, there are too many variables for me to really speak to. Oh, don't get don't buy X technical spec. Don't buy Y technical spec. Um, yeah, it's, there's just so many variables to it. OK, so um, we got a couple comments on the security topic uh, from Bill Hayes, and he just wanted oh, hey, to share. Bill. <laughs> yes, say Bill. Thank you. Um, ATSC3 chose not to incorporate the hybrid uh, broadband TV, which is prevalent in Europe. Not to discount that security issue, but I don't think, but he's saying that they might, that might not be as big an, an issue as it might be for ATSC3. Um, so I just wanted to add that in. And then he wrote, just to add more confusion to the UHD definition, the UHD forum now considers 1080p with HDR and WCG as part of the UHD phase A content parameters. Can you put that into English for our non-technical members of the audience today? Awesome. I, I mean, basically what he means is that they're going to include 1080p when they talk about UHD. So that's another great example of words don't mean words. Um, so when uh, that's, oh, that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I guess now when we're talking about UHD, we're not limited to a resolution. We're also going to be talking about 1080p with those um, those additional features, those HDR and, and wide color gamut, um, which I'm going to describe in more detail in a little bit. So if you don't know what those are, don't worry, we will get to it. Um, also, the, the thing about HBB TV that is good. Um, I am my bigger concern is that the way we do signal validation is by is it present on a frequency and that's something we need to stop regardless of because we are still going to have ip layer stuff in atsc3 i'm glad we're not going with the same one that's been demonstrated attacks on it um but we do need to have a better um server client authentication mechanism than just is it there is it modulated right cool i will do whatever sure so, uh got one more how much content is actually available for 4k tv i only see sports mostly being offered in 4k so 4K, the content that is available in 4K is largely online content. The online stuff came first, um, and it's Netflix has it, Amazon has it. It's a little hard to find. Um, that basically, you have to Google for the tricks to find it, and there are normally specific search terms you use to find the the stuff that is 4K, the stuff that is also there's HDR stuff, there's wide color gamut stuff. Um, there's... Also, some satellite uh, stuff. I don't, I'm not totally sure if it's available in America yet, but there are satellite services worldwide that are providing 4K content. It's not super prevalent. Um, so we'll see it hitting the satellite services next, and then it's going to hit cable, and then it's going to hit broadcast, is my opinion of how the content is going to, to, to become prevalent. Also, obviously, you have UHD Blu ray discs, so physical media, you can get a very solid um, 4K HDR wide color gamut picture out of those now. I was going to mention uh, the, the Blu ray discs for those of us who still like a hard copy of something. I think, um, doesn't Sony have some kind of black box thing that you, appliance that is, is offer subscription 4K? Yeah, the, that thing kind of dropped off because really nobody bought it. Um, I'm not sure if that service is even still active. Um, my recollection is they they killed it, but I'm not 100% sure. It was not widely adopted, but there was when it was a big push for Sony selling 4K TVs. They were trying to sell this box because they their big problem trying to sell them two years ago is there was no content. So they said, here's a box. It's got content. You can get more content through this box. Buy it. Um, but that was really kind of a stopgap until the the digital services were catching up and caught up. Um, now the digital services have largely caught up and are in in any way that they can control the content, they're, they're pushing for 4K content for HDR content. Um, even Chromecast, the Chromecast Ultra supports 4K HDR. Um, you can get 4K HDR content on YouTube. Just Google for it and you'll find it and it actually looks amazing. Yeah. And we got a couple more uh, comments from Bill that he fully agrees regarding the security, and ATSC has a committee focusing on that. He's also sent me the link to the Phase A content specifications. So if you want to geek out on that, I will add that to the chat window. And that is all the questions we have right now, Chris. 
Sweet. Yeah, Bill is Bill has always been the guy carrying the torch of let's let's be clear about what we're talking about. And I fall into it too, and he calls me out on it. We're on a call, I'll call something 4K when it's not 4K. And on the pro side, we do need to be very careful about talking about what we're talking about, knowing what we're talking about when we're talking about these things and not lapsing into those consumer marketing terms that are so easy to lapse into, but lack the degree of specificity that we require for pro work. So thank you, Bill, for carrying that torch. And we need to all carry that torch. All right. Connections. Uh, I keep losing focus on the window. All right. There's only one connection we're going to talk about today and it's HDMI. Um, it's basically the living room is almost entirely standardized on HDMI. Um, everybody who's not running things HDMI, who's running through other other cabling mechanisms, is largely dealing with legacy equipment. Um, me included. I've got an older receiver, so I'm still doing you know some optical audio stuff and this and that. But all of the formats going forward, and really all of the the formats over the past few years on the consumer side, have been tailored for HDMI and only HDMI. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, which we'll get into as we talk about HDMI. So what is HDMI? HDMI is the high definition multimedia interface. It is digital only. It's audio video interface. It is backwards, excuse me, backwards compatible with DVI, uh, D and I, um, but it goes beyond DVI. Has audio, which is great for, you know, the stuff we do. Has copy protection, which is great for the stuff we do. Also great for the movie studios, content creators. That's Partly why HDMI is the one connection to rule them all, because it's got a lot of backing from uh, from the movie studios and from the TV studios who want to protect uh, their their content on the physical side, on the physical connections. Uh, it's also got Ethernet. I I don't know of many, if any, people who use the Ethernet part of HDMI, and that was also true of audio return channel until very recently. Um, audio return channel is basically a mechanism by which you can say you've got a receiver uh, that's the core of your living room. You've got all your sources going to your receiver, one HDMI cable going from your receiver to your TV. Your receiver picks what content is played on the TV. Problem with doing that, TVs nowadays have a ton of processing in them. They're upscaling, downscaling, subsampling, super sampling, all this crap that they're doing. Um, if you have motion flow turned on, God forbid, uh, it's doing that stuff too. Um, and that introduces a ton of latency. So if you're going through a receiver, um, you're going to have sync issues because your video is going to be behind your audio. And that's the worst case to be in. Human beings can only accommodate 10 milliseconds max of audio leading video before our brains start getting really weirded out and confused. Um, so this audio return channel allows us to overcome that because it lets the TV send audio once it's in all its processing, send the audio signal back to the receiver delayed and lets the receiver play it out and play it out in sync. There are other uses for audio return channel. I personally can't really describe them because I don't use them, but that's the main one that we, especially those of us who um, have done audio engineering and who've been you know, going to AES, this was something that got brought up at AES like 10 years ago with the, the sync issue and all the audio engineers rabble rousing about it. So audio return channel is a way to mitigate that sync issue um, that's inherent from these TVs doing a ton of processing. Now, if you use the TV's internal speakers, doesn't matter, you're all good, you're all in sync, but may not sound that great. Uh, there's also HDR metadata uh, able to be carried in the HDMI interface. So HDCP, what is HDCP? HDCP is your worst nightmare if you're trying to hook stuff up via HDMI. Um, it is high bandwidth digital content protection. It's supposed to be dictated by the content. The, the specs, at least all the specs and white papers and all that that I've read, um, imply that if content is protected, HDCP should turn on. That said, it's been implemented lazily by almost every manufacturer that I've tested. Um, Xbox is a great example. Xbox, the Xbox One turns on without HDCP on. And so the signal is not protected at all. You can see the menu, you can record the menu, you can whatever you want. Once you go into, say, a Blu-ray, when you start playing a Blu-ray, HDCP turns on. If you have a recording device connected, it stops working. That HDCP stays on from then on forever until you unplug the Xbox and plug it back in, even if you switch back to non-protected content. That's not supposed to be how it's implemented, but there's, there isn't a real strict uh, um, 
spec or enforcement on that implementation. So it's implemented very lazily and it's implemented on the side, erring on the side of caution, right? On the side of protecting versus not protecting, uh, which drives people crazy who are actually trying to use HDMI signals for say pro work or for projectors or for recording or any of these things. Um, it is generally illegal to remove in the US. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to go through every exemption. And those exemptions change because they're reviewed by the library, librarian excuse me, of Congress every, I want to say, six years. It's some ridiculously long time in the, uh, the realm of tech, but Librarian of Congress reviews those. There are exceptions. There are exceptions that are specific to a lot of stuff we do, to education, to nonprofit, to documentary work. So if you're looking at a scenario where you may want to slash need to remove copy protection. Um, and this doesn't apply just to HTCP. It just applies to other uh, versions of copy protection as well, like disc-based. Um, look up what the latest exemptions are. You may uh, fall under an exception and be able to do it legally. Uh, if, and if you're hooking up HDMI equipment, get a black screen, you can probably blame some HTCP problem somewhere in your chain. This is probably the biggest question I get about 4K. Do I need new cables for 4K? No, maybe this, I hate not seeing the audience because normally this gets a laugh. I don't know if anyone's laughing. I hope you are because it's funny in like a sort of sad, I want to cry kind of way. I, love, um, I laughed, Chris. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. I need that, that positive affirmation. I'm realizing that like, I, I really need a crowd in front of me. Otherwise I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. I'll just assume I am. Um, so this is. This is why you may or may not need good, or this is why you may or may not need new cables. So the dotted line you're seeing right here is the line between HDMI specs, between HDMI 1.4B and HDMI 2.0. You'll see the, the, bit, the bandwidth on the far right is the bandwidth that the cables got to accommodate to pass these signals, right? Um, so HDMI 2.0, you see that jump to uh, 2160 60p. So that's 4K, 60p, 420 color sampling, 8-bit. That's 8.91 gigabit. So that's an HDMI 2.0 signal. So you need devices that can support it. But technically, your cables, those same cables uh, that worked for HDMI 1.4b, should work for 2.0 because that's the same bandwidth, right? Problem with that is that this line is the line for the spec for the cables. Now we have the, what the cables we're talking about are high speed cables, which have existed for kind of forever. So if you bought an HDMI cable in the last like 10 years or so, it's probably a high speed cable. This was the spec that the cable manufacturers were told to design to. Now they were just told to design to that. There wasn't a ton of industry wide testing and certification. There wasn't really a, a strict certification process. Um, so your cable, you know, your, your, your uh, cable experience may vary. Um, so this, you can see why this is a problem because these cables only get you the first little hop of the way into HDMI 2.0. And that's a problem because this next hop that goes above 10.2 gigabit is the spec for UHD Blu-ray discs. So you could have a cable that technically works for HDMI 2.0 that technically shows you a 4K 60 signal, but as soon as you play your UHD disc, it goes black, or you're on the edge of the digital cliff and you start getting little pixels and little, you know, the, the little sparklies that we get when we're at the edge of the digital cliff. Uh, you maybe get some green ringing around the edges. These are all things that I've personally seen in my house doing poor jobs, hooking things up to each, <laughs> to each other. Um, so you can see how that can be a problem. So then everything from then on up, if you've only got a cable that works at 10.2 gig, you're not going to be able to do any of these other formats that are all the way up there. And that very top format doesn't exist yet, by the way, that 72 gigabit that's not included in any standard currently, that's just a projected thing. Um, so what do we do? How do we know if a cable can do this stuff? You can test it. Number one, the nice thing about digital is when you plug it in, doesn't work, and you've eliminated the HTCP stuff that I mentioned earlier as a problem, um, you know it's the cable because digital is largely it works or doesn't work. There's a, there's a very small margin uh, in which it only half works. So the best way to test it is just plug it in, see if it works. If it works, cool, you're good to go. Um, the more expensive ways to have a bunch of test gear. Uh, we have a bunch of test gear because we've been doing obviously a lot of this, this research to present to all you fine people. Um, but most people don't have HDMI test gear. So they came up, the HDMI licensing LLC came up with the HDMI premium certification. Um, this is an actually fairly rigorous uh, testing process. 
uh, you have to have your cables tested at these authorized testing centers, guarantee 18 gigabit bandwidth, uh, and you get that fancy sticker. So that fancy sticker is how you know you have a certified cable. So if you buy a bunch of great stuff, you buy a new 4K TV, you buy, you know, say an Xbox One X or S, uh, plug it in with your existing cables, nothing works. Maybe go out, try one of these premium certified cables that may, may fix your problem. But a lot of cables, especially thicker cables, um, if they used good wire and heavy wire, they will still work up to 18 gigabit. I've got cables that were 1080p cables that are high speed cables that I've tested at 18 gig and are working just fine. So it's really gonna vary wildly. Your existing cables may or may not work. And that's unfortunately the best I can tell you. All right, EDID, EDID is super fun. Uh, EDID is extended display identification data. And basically it's how devices over HDMI, when you, when you plug in HDMI, if you've ever plugged in HDMI connection, you know there's that little bit of uh, like blip, right? You plug it in, both devices kind of go for a couple seconds and then a picture displays or it doesn't. Um, the the EDID is what controls that and it controls the, it's the handshake basically. So here's how it should work. The device, I've got an Xbox on the left, talks to the screen on the right, says, hey, what can you do? Screen says here, I can support up to, say I can support up to 4K, you know, 420, blah, 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 blah. Device says, cool, here's a signal you can handle. And the EDID is not going to contain everything that the device can support. It's going to contain the maximum it can support because the implication is that everything below that is also supported. So it's going to contain resolution information. It's going to contain bit depth. It's going to contain color sampling. It's also going to contain um, some audio information and then a, you know, a couple other things, you know, timing and stuff like that. Um, gets super technical. I'm not technically a signals engineer, so I don't get super deep into the engineering of it. Um, but it's got a bunch of stuff and lets uh, devices talk to each other. So then it says, cool. And then we're all good. Everything's plugged in. You see a picture. I should have actually put a picture in the little graphic, but whatever. Assume you see a picture. Cool. Here's how it sometimes works. Not good. Um, this happens, tends to happen with cheaper devices. Uh, it tends also to happen when you have things in the chain that uh, are intermediaries like switches, routers, matrix switches, you know, stuff like that, um, stuff that delays the signal. So if you, um, also if you have devices that are really cheap and have very small buffers or very short timeouts, stuff like that, it is possible for these handshakes to have problems and not work, uh, and then the devices go to sleep. Normally, if you can't solve this, say you've got a device that's not great, I see this a lot with projectors, with especially older projectors that are still in service, still do a good job, but maybe don't do the handshake right. Um, there are something called EDID uh, ghosts or ghosters <clears throat> that you can put in the chain that are always sending out uh, the correct EDID information and sending it out uh, quickly. And so you can eliminate handshake problems by always having a device in the chain that is specific for handshakes. And uh, you can get them on Amazon, they're pretty cheap, um, but they tend to solve that problem. But be aware that this is sometimes a problem you can have with largely older devices, um, largely cheaper devices, you know, not manufactured super well. So here's what a firm handshake looks like. Uh, this is really nice. So the Xbox One series of game consoles, Xbox One S and the Xbox One X, which is coming out this November, um, are actually pretty, if you want to get into testing consumer signals, um, and especially 4K HDR, stuff like that, the Xbox One S is a pretty cheap platform on which to do that because it, it can generate a whole lot of signals, has a whole lot of content you can access, and it's got this nice little details thing that tells you what it thinks the device it's hooked up to can support. So this is everything happy. I've got it hooked up to a sweet 4K TV. It can do all the stuff I want it to do. Cool. It's all happy. This is less good. Uh, it can't support, it can do 4K, but it can't do uh, 4K 10 bit, it can't do HDR, um, not great. So the difference is, and the pitfall for consumers, on this particular TV, I had to go into the general settings, not picture settings, and enable HDMI Ultra HD Deep Color, which is also a just pile of words that kinda don't really mean much. Um, I had to enable this on every input and restart the TV before the Xbox would actually give me this nice, everything's gonna work, it's all good. Um, this I think is a big takeaway from this presentation is that there are so many gotchas with this stuff. Everything is very, very touchy. The HDMI spec, the HDCP spec, uh, the EDID stuff, the, the settings on each individual TV, it's all very, very touchy and it's very easy to not have it set up right. 
So expect some level of pain if you're trying to set up a, a correct chain to display, um, especially from consumer devices, 4K, 60, HDR, wide color gamut content. Um, this took me forever to figure out and I have a pile of test gear and I give presentations about this stuff. So it's, it's really scary for consumers dealing with this stuff. And all of this changes. Not only can those, those connections and those handshakes be, um, be a little unstable and a little unreliable, the output, for, output format chain can change to follow the content. So using the Xbox again as an example. So here is the Amazon video screen on Xbox. I have a two and a half year old, so we watch a ton of Daniel Tiger. Um, on this screen, it's putting out uh, RGB 444, 8-bit, 17.8 gig. So if I had one of those bad cables, one of those older cables that can only do 10 gig, I would see nothing on this screen, which wouldn't let me actually get to the content. When you get to the content, it drops down to 11.125 gig, which is the same. This, this spec now, once I'm playing content, is the same spec uh, as the UHD disc uh, format that I went to earlier. But to get there, I had to go through a much higher bandwidth screen, which may not have worked through my old cables. So this, it's, there's, there's this variance in what you're watching and it's gonna change from content to content to content. Um, Netflix actually, they're one that doesn't change. So their menu uh, is that same roughly UHD spec. Um, and then when you, uh, no, I don't have an example of their content. Anyway, when you go into their content, this is the same. So, and Netflix is actually consistent with it. And I like that better as an app design choice because I think that's a more, that's a better experience for the consumer. That's a more consistent experience for the consumer. And then there's the Xbox menu itself, which also outputs at 17.8 gigs. So you can't even get to the Amazon app if you don't have good enough cables. It won't even work on the home screen. That one I think is actually pretty solid because if you see the Xbox screen, you know that you can support anything that's going to run on the Xbox. So that's your, that's sort of like your EDID, you know, uh, uh, highest spec, right? You're hitting that high spec right out the gate. You know that from then on, anything that plays is going to be that spec or lower and your equipment can handle it. But if you can't see it, you're going to be very frustrated because you won't even know this unless you watch this presentation, which hopefully you did. All right, so we'll stop for a sec before we get into HDR and wide color gamut and see if anybody's got questions on any of the, the connection and, and interconnect stuff. Yep. Um, Chris, first, I'm pleased to report that we have multiple confirmations of laughter. So I wanted you to be assured re right. on that. Front. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, we got a couple uh, Xbox comments and questions from Justin. He mentions that Xbox doesn't have photo mode in the game Horizon Zero Dawn, so just thought I'd pass that along. <laughs> <laughs> That's pro So there's there's a few people who know me personally who are probably just here trolling me. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> All right. And then uh, his question is, does the Xbox Connect still connect to the TV stations? I recall being able to change channels with this device. Yes, we're, so we're going to get to discussing the Xbox later in the presentation, so I will touch on that. Yes, it still does. I really like it, and I want everyone to know about it, but I'm going to hit, I've got a slide for that in a bit, so stand by. All right, that's everything that's come in for that section. Sweet. Okay, so we will move on. I said that I would hit on HDR and WCG, which are high dynamic range and wide color gamut. Um, these are things that are very prevalent in marketing um, and are, I think, a bit more important than this conversation about resolution. Um, so this is a poor representation of HDR that I put together for Twitter real fast to just show people kind of here's, here's what it is. So standard dynamic range on the left, high dynamic range on the right. We're talking about, when we're talking about dynamic range, we're talking about contrast, right? We're talking about the, the distance between the brightest white and the blackest black. Contrast is the most important thing to the human visual system. It is more important than resolution. It's more important even than color. Um, so it's the reason, contrast is the reason why when you're driving in fog, um, you can't regulate your speed without looking at the speedometer because we don't, our brains don't have enough contrast in dense fog to do the interpretation to figure out how fast am I really going. So that's why in fog, there's a lot more accidents because our brains just are not designed to deal with it. So I would argue that HDR, high dynamic range, is a more important 
big jump for visual quality uh, on these new TVs than 4K is. So let's go to a better representation. Um, this is from Larry Thorpe's uh, white paper, the uh, high dynamic range white paper that he did for Canon. Um, it is an excellent white paper uh, if you're interested in what HDR is, how it works, the technology behind it. Um, I've got a link to it right here. There's a link in the PDF that you can check out. I would strongly recommend reading the whole thing um, because it is he did a really excellent job explaining it. But you can see that on the, on the left, you've got the new consumer HDR. There's a much wider range. So nits, nits are a measure of brightness, are a measure of physical brightness of the screen. So current screens don't get super black and they don't get super bright. New screens do, and that's actually a physical difference. It's not just the content. It's not just the content looks different. The screens themselves, the panels themselves are putting out more light in the white areas and less light in the black areas. So let's talk about the specs. And these are actual specifications as opposed to marketing specifications. So the first one we're going to talk about is HDR10. HDR10 is kind of the, the baseline HDR that pretty much everybody supports across the board in anything that supports HDR. It's an open standard, maxes out at 10-bit depth. There's one HDR setting for the whole piece of content. So its critics will say that, oh, if you have a really bright scene followed by a really dark scene, it's not going to look as good when mastered for HDR10 because there, um, there's no metadata to allow for changes between super bright scenes and super dark scenes. So it's not going to look as good. Um, it's not going to carry over the artistic intent is the, the argument against it, which I'll address later when we talk about other ones. Uh, it requires HDMI 2.0a and greater. And it requires HDCP 2.2 for protected content like Blu-rays, UHD Blu-rays, that kind of stuff. Uh, this is the required standard for HDR on UHD Blu-rays. So that kind of got it in the door. It is the requirement, sort of the same reason, you know, back in the day for DVDs, uh, Dolby Digital was the required audio standard. Everything was optional. And that pushed, um, that pushed a lot of things toward Dolby. Same thing here. Since it's a standard on these discs, a lot of other places said, oh, TVs are going to support it. You know, Netflix is going to support it. Amazon's going to support it. So it's really easy to make that argument of, oh, this is sort of what we're standardizing as a baseline. There are other things, which I'm going to get to now. Um, it's also not backwards compatible with SDR displays, which is another um, mark against it, I guess. But the, the specs that are backwards compatible have gotchas in that backwards compatibility, which we'll, we'll talk about. So Dolby Vision is the same underlying tech, basically, as HDR10, um, but it builds on it and is, is um, more higher quality. Uh, it's a closed standard, though, so TV makers have to pay to include it. So that's one of the marks against it. Does go to 12-bit depth, though, which is a mark for it, higher than 10-bit. Uh, and it's got HDR settings can change throughout the content, so you don't have that um, problem where you're going from dark to light, um, you can actually optimize on a per scene basis what it looks like. And so you're going to get better visual fidelity. Technically, it only requires HDMI 1.4 plus. It, there's some, some magic that it does basically to get its signals through that 1.4. Um, again, I, I haven't gone that far down that rabbit hole of the signals engineering part, so I can't tell you exactly what it does. But technically, you can put, put a Dolby Vision signal through a 1.4 pipe. Um, it's also optional on HD, Ultra HD Blu-rays. Um, it's not, uh, it's included in the spec, but it's not required. It's optional. Can be backwards compatible with SDR displays. Um, I believe there are gotchas in there. I don't know specifically what they are um, because I wasn't able, they don't like really talk about that a lot. Um, and I don't have enough Dolby Vision stuff here to do the testing myself. Um, so be wary of that backwards compatible thing, but they are technically backwards compatible. And I, I don't know if Bill Hayes is like typing away on what it actually is, but Bill, if you know, let us know. Um, so HDR 10 plus, this is my favorite one. Um, so HD, it's HDR 10, it's solving the problem of HDR's difference between it and Dolby Vision, right? Dolby Vision, the big thing is it can have dynamic metadata and it can change. Well, Samsung and Amazon announced literally the day I gave this presentation at TechCon uh, that HDR10 Plus is now a thing, which is HDR10 with the addition of dynamic metadata. I think it's the uh, SMPTE 2094, 
spec, maybe, question mark. Uh, it's this, the spec that adds dynamic metadata basically to, uh, to HDR10. Um, so that's one of the gotchas that's no longer a gotcha between HDR10 um, and Dolby Vision. Now, of course, manufacturer sets have to actually roll out, you know, firmware and software and all that to support it, um, which they've largely said they're going to do. Um, but it's still super new, so I haven't actually kept up on how they're doing rolling that out. But expect to see that in newer TVs coming out. And then there's HLG. So HLG is a big one in the pro world, and it's the one that the BBC and NHK are pushing because it is simple for live production. It's simple for, you know, sports and events and that kind of stuff. There are no settings, so it makes transmission super simple. But the, the flip side of that is there's no per scene, per scene optimization. Also dealing with 10-bit depth. Uh, it's not part of any specs. Um, it's not part of the UHD spec. Um, it's not, I don't think they finalized the ATSC 3 HDR spec, um, but they're working on it, but it doesn't sound like they're going to be cutting any out of that, um, so that don't expect ATSC 3 to be the decider between them, it seems like. Um, it requires HDMI 2.0 B+, uh, and it can be backwards compatible with SDR displays, but this is one of those gotchas. Um, this is only for Rec 2020 color space. Um, which I'll explain in a second. So if you have a display, an SDR display that can only display Rec. 709, that backwards comp compatibility is not going to be super useful for you. So wide color gamut, basically more colors. Um, you can see the smallest rectangle is the colors that can be displayed under the Rec. 709 um, color gamut. Not a ton of them. And the, so this whole chart, I should back up, this whole kind of curved uh, triangle that we're looking at here is the spectrum of human vision. These are all the colors we can see basically poorly represented on a monitor, but basically it's what we can see. Um, from up from there, you have DCI-P3, which is a wider color gamut, shows more colors, you know, deeper reds, deeper blues. Um, then up from there is 2020. 2020 does a pretty good job of encompassing most of what we can see. It still drops off some of the, you know, uh, cyan and, and green off there to the left, um, but it's the widest of the color gamuts. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about color gamut. And largely, the, um, I don't know if you can hear my cat meowing in the background, but of course the cat's meowing. Get out of here, cat. Um, anyway, so... 2020 is the widest and is the one that we're shooting for in content. Um, a lot of 4K content that is HDR, that is wide color gamut, shooting for 2020. But be aware that none of the TVs, at least the TVs that uh, have currently been tested that I'm aware of, can display all of 2020. They can accept that signal, but they can only display, I don't know, this is kind of a small slide, so I don't know if you can read it. They can display pretty much all of the DCI-P3 that... Uh, that um, solid line triangle, but they can only display up to, it looks like 77% is the highest any TV goes uh, of the 2020 spectrum. We'll get there. We'll get there eventually, but be aware that that panels are not there yet to show all those colors. They're accepting that signal, but they're doing some processing behind the scenes to kind of, you know, best guess and dither and all the, you know, whatever fancy stuff they're doing that adds latency in the background. So we'll stop here for a second. Any other questions or anyone want to correct me on anything I just said? Either way. Sure, uh, sure we have a few uh, comments to share. I have literally more illuminating information from Bill, which is that nits are candelas per square meter. And I know. I wasn't um, going to go that deep on it. Thank you, Bill. There is, there is some speculation that we need immersive audio to hear your cat. <laughs> well, that's good. And, and uh, Bill's passing me a link to the SMPTE uh, presentation, so I'm going to put that in the chat as soon as I can get it. I can't copy it out of the software. Um, and the question is, was Odin the cat who was meowing? No, it was Alice. Okay. The, again, um, people who know me probably have two cats. It was, it was Alice. <laughs> and, and mine just joined me and just barked at me. Um, yeah, see? It's cats, man. When can... When can consumers expect that the standards war for HDR should come to a resolution? Nice choice of words. There. Oh, man. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's something we're all fighting and are still fighting. And it's, I don't think we will truly have a, this is the way everyone's gone until ATSC3 is out and broadcasters are broadcasting HDR and we see who does what. 
and uh, maybe who who makes a deal to standardize or standardize in markets or whatever, because it seems like there's going to be some leeway once three rolls out and it's the spec may not actually dictate everyone do this, everyone do that. So there could be a situation where market by market, there's different HDR. I don't think we'll go that way because that's bad for us as a as an industry. <laughs> um, but technically, I, I think there, there's a scenario in which that could be allowed under the technical spec. Um, at this point, though, I'm pretty confident that um, TVs that we're buying now will be able to adapt to whatever happens in the lifespan of those TVs. Like I said, those lifespans are getting shorter. So we're talking about three inside three, outside five, unless like you throw something through your TV, right? Three to five years if I buy a TV right now. I think if I buy a TV right now, even if it doesn't support, say, HLG right now, I will have the ability to software upgrade it to support HLG if I need it in the next three to five years. I am personally fairly confident in that, and I'm personally going to be buying a 4K TV this fall probably, so I'm putting my money behind my personal confidence. But that's all really all any of us can do is kind of guess at, at what's going to happen. So Bill adds, at CES, LG was showing televisions that could handle any of the most common HDR standards, which is another interesting development. Like, we, if, if the industry is not going to pick a standard, we'll just put them all in. Yes, and that's also a very good point, is we're seeing a lot of chips come out, even chips for that are designed for mobile, that are designed for tablets and um, phones, that will support all of them. Because... Why not? I mean, really, it's just math, right? You're you're putting different math operations in there. You're putting transform, you know, electro optical transforms in there. Why not put two? Why not put three? If that's a better way to future proof a device, cool. Let's do it. Um, I mean, Sony in the PS4, the PlayStation 4, they put tech in it years before they were actually going to use it, so that when they launched a higher spec model, they could flip a switch with firmware and turn on. HDMI 2.0 capabilities with HDR in the older devices that were launched years before that stuff was even finalized. So we are seeing uh, manufacturers do this stuff, and it's actually really impressive from an engineering perspective. And that's everything we have right now, Chris. Awesome. All right. So we will get into the other stuff, all the other stuff, probably not all the other stuff, but like the stuff that I care about. Audio. Audio is a big thing. Uh, so someone made a joke about immersive audio. Yes, immersive audio, I think, will be a big thing. Um, but another big question I get is about surround sound, um, specifically 5.1 systems, adoption of 5.1 systems. There isn't a ton of great data about surround system ownership. Um, there were sales numbers, but the, the ownership and the usage data is either not there or is not there uh, outside of thousand plus dollar paywalls that I can't afford. Um, so the most recent specific data I have is mid-2013. Surround sound ownership was declining and had declined to 29% of households. The problem with this number is that it varies wildly. Um, this is my favorite anecdote from a uh, cable installer from, I think, a Comcast uh, tech that goes, you know, goes to people's houses, hooks up all their stuff. Telling stories of multiple customers where they bought a 5.1 system and put all five speakers in a row on top of the television. So I don't think we can, that 29% of households, I don't think we can use that as any sort of, of indicator of anything because who knows what it is. Honestly, the five speakers on top of the TV, that's worse than just doing, oh, I, li I like your poll, Kevin. That's good. Do you have a surround sound system? Um, also, if you have like 11.2 installed in your house, I would be very interested to, to talk to you about what your house looks like. Um, so yeah, we can't really target that because that's, if you have five in a row on top of TV, that's even worse. That's even worse than having built in stereo sound or, you know, stereo speakers. That's going to give you a worse experience. It's all going to be muddy and crazy. So right now we're about 60, 40, uh, yes on that. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty solid. Um, you know, obviously this, the audience of uh, people who would listen to a webinar, an over over an hour long webinar on <laughs> living room technology, probably I actually would have expected that to be a little higher, probably. Um, so that's that is interesting. Um, I personally have one. I don't use it. I don't have the back surrounds hooked up, and I have everything um, faked to stereo. So that's because that's 
the way my house is set up. And I was, and I am personally capable of running cables through walls and I just haven't. So if I'm not going to do it, I'm not sure many consumers will. Um, that said, I don't, th- I do think that immersive audio surround audio is very important. And I think the way we get there is stuff like sound bars. Sound bars are very attractive as consumer products and they're becoming very popular. They passed 1 billion in sales in 2016. Um, and they allow us to virtualize the surround experience, right? On a good sound bar with good processing, you can get pretty solid sounding surround. It's not going to be as good as a, you know, THX calibrated 5.1, all the speakers in the Simti spots, which I actually have a little issue with where Simti puts the surrounds and, and music people do too. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but I think sound bars are the way that and stuff like that and and whatever evolves from that is the way that we're going to really get immersive adoption in the home and people to really realize the value of it. Um, I'm not going to go through every last audio format. They are large. They have 5.1 compatibility methods anyway. Um, There's all kinds of different ways to encode this stuff and and different layers of encoding different metadata. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, But 5.1 is still the basic baseline target if you're targeting surround. Um, But I think that to the soundbar point, I think that the AR and VR industries are going to really help us out because they're going to do the work on the DSP side to come up with ways to virtualize this stuff, ways to get really great sounding surround out of a soundbar, out of headphones, out of things or out of mobile phones, out of, you know, cars, cars have had, you know, immersive DSP forever. Um, These are the things that I think are, can actually appeal to consumers and can actually be adopted um, at a rate, you know, above 29% of households who largely just put them on top of their TV anyway. So I don't, I think that discrete surround systems are on the decline and are probably about to be dead, but I don't think immersive audio is going anywhere. And I think it's going to be very important to the future of a lot of different content types. Cable boxes. Somebody asked me about cable boxes at TechCon. Um, I didn't actually have them in my presentation before someone asked me about them because they're terrible. uh, They cost us a ton and they probably won't change. So it's really hard to talk about cable boxes because they're, it's, they're awful. Um, they cost way more than they should. They haven't been revised for over a decade, I can say pretty confidently. Um, we're dealing with a problem here in, in um, our market that I'm sure a lot of other people are, that the cable boxes of a certain very large provider can only deal with one secondary audio channel, period, and it has to be hard-coded to Spanish. So if we want our descriptive, uh, descriptive video channel, which we carry both, we carry Spanish and we carry descriptive video as two separate audio services, because for kids programming in our market, it's very important to have both because we have a lot of English as a second language, bilingual, a um, lot of those audiences watching. So it's important for us to always carry both. But if we want DVS to make it through the cable system, they, and I'm going back and back and forth with them, they said that we have to flag the DVS as Spanish, which is not spec compliant with how ATSC says to do it. So, but we're doing it because we want people to hear it. So we're flagging DVS as Spanish and we're Spanish flagging Spanish as French. And that's solely because cable boxes are terrible. Um, and that's my anecdote on cable boxes. That's really all I've got. Streaming boxes, streaming boxes are cooler. Um, and there's, and this also sort of illustrates the, um, importance in measurement and how quickly things change. So you can see on the left, um, a lot of people have got connected game consoles and you also notice this game console number is millions on the left is millions. And then on the right is device share. So they're measuring slightly different things, but you can see the total numbers, um, on the left. So most, most devices are connected game consoles followed by smart TVs. And then you got Blu-ray, Chromecast, Roku. Um, but on the right, you see, Roku's got a 49% market share of the OTT devices. And maybe you're thinking, wait, on the left, Chromecast is beating Roku. Well, notice that the left is from October 2016. The right is, you may not be able to see, it's super small, from March 2016. Here's the growth. 2017 year-over-year change. Chromecast is killing it in terms of growth. Chromecasts are cheap. Chromecasts are easy. You fling stuff to them. Great, fine. 
So Chromecast has very recently surpassed Roku um, as the most popular streaming device, at least according to all the data that I have access to. Again, everybody conducts their stuff in slightly different ways, um, but Chromecast is if you're picking one device to target that isn't you know a TV, um, Chromecast is a really solid, solid one. And you can build Chromecast support into, you know, web applications. You can put the little Chromecast button, build into mobile applications, build in, you know, PBS app obviously has the Chromecast button, which is really smart move because this adoption rate says that that is a good feature and that's a feature we need to have. It's also streaming TV services. And this gets murky for uh, those of us in PBS because our... The way we operate, and I'm going to try not to screw this up and try not to get too deep because, again, I am not a lawyer and nothing I say is legal advice. Um, but my understanding from speaking with lawyers is because we operate under a different legal framework than CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox, um, we don't really have the same ability to be on these services that they do. They can uh, negotiate retransmission, right? They can negotiate a retransmission fee, get retransmitted onto these services. Cool. We as PBS, we can't do that. We don't do that. We are carried by all the systems under must carry. That's how we're carried, period. Um, my understanding is that because of how the laws work and because of how Congress works, um, we can, cannot legally sign a must carry agreement with, say, YouTube TV. That's just not how we work in terms of how we've been established under the law. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I might be kind of wrong in that. That is my understanding. So these services do exist, but you're currently not seeing PBS um, on any of them for various legal reasons and Congress reasons. Um, but DirecTV's got one, YouTube's got one, PlayStation's got one, Sling's got one, um, Apple's got one or going to have one. I forget where they're at with theirs. Um, these are popping up more and more and more and they're, you know, costing, you know, around 30 bucks and then you can add some other stuff to them. Um, but they're gaining popularity. They're still a fairly small segment of the viewing population, but they are gaining popularity. And then we got VR. These are definitely not super adopted yet, um, but there's a lot of buzz around them. And so we've got the bottom left is the sort of baseline. It's literally cardboard. You stick your phone in it. It's called Google Cardboard. You stick your phone in it. You get a very baseline um, VR experience through the cardboard app. It's a very good entry into VR to trying VR. And it's only, you know, 10 bucks maybe, or you could you know, do a lot of cutting and build your own and get some lenses and stuff. But it's, you know, it's like 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, or I think New York Times gave away a ton of them recently. Um, then to the right of it, you're stepping up, or sorry, I'm going to go to the upper right. You're stepping up to the um, Google Daydream and the Samsung Gear VR. These are also phone-based VR platforms, but they have processing inside them. So you put the phone in, but they the device it, the, itself also has horsepower. Um, so you get a higher fidelity VR experience. Um, it's sort of the, like the middle class of VR right now. And so the Samsung one obviously only works with Samsung phones. The Google one works with Google phones. Uh, bottom right, you have PlayStation VR. Works with the PlayStation consoles. Um, and it uh, is... Probably a bit higher quality um, than the uh, the Samsung Gear VR and the the Google one, um, but it's obviously tethered to your console and is a lot less portable. And then the top, the big bad boys, are in the upper left are the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. These are PC based products. These are going to be your highest fidelity, but also um, most expensive. Uh, require a lot of space, especially HTC Vive, to place like sensors and stuff so it can see what you're doing. Um, the cool part though is that. There's a lot of positional stuff you can do uh, with those upper left ones. So if you're in VR and you say kneel down, your perspective actually changes and you can sort of look at things from different angles and, and if your cable's long enough, move around a little bit. So though it's a really cool experience, um, but again, not super widely adopted yet. And then we have game consoles. Um, the two we're going to talk about because they are... The ones that are, they're the most current, they're obviously previous generations, um, but they support the most media options, uh, Sony PlayStation 4 and the Microsoft Xbox One. The PlayStation 4 is basically OTT video apps. Netflix, Amazon, uh, some of the video streaming services, like I said, they have their own streaming service as well called PlayStation View. It does play Blu-rays, but it doesn't play UHD Blu-rays, and it has that PlayStation VR option that you can get um, to do some VR on it. 
on the Xbox One, um, like I, we had someone ask about it. Um, it has the OTD stuff, plays Blu-rays, and it can play UHD Blu-rays on the S and upcoming X model. It also supports USB tuners, so you can plug an antenna into your Xbox One, which is how I watch TV at home, and you get uh, guide data. There's the little, so there's a little guide. It gets guide data from Rovi. So if you ever get a complaint about Xbox listings being screwed up, your programming people need to get in touch with Rovi. That's who powers it. Um, it also supports HDMI input for cable boxes. So if you have cable instead of OTA, you can still watch through the Xbox um, and the Xbox acts as an IR blaster to change the channel on your cable box. A little bit clunky, but it does work. Uh, there's no DVR, but it can rewind up to 30 minutes. Uh, and the Xbox also does not have a VR option. So big thing to be aware of is that you can watch TV through the Xbox One, and it's actually pretty solid. So we're going to stop there before we get into this next section is products that I really like. Um, so does anyone have questions on the, the device stuff that I just sped through? Yep, we got some stuff here. Sorry, I just lost my place. Asking a question back. Let's see. So um, how much is it of a cost is it to buy a soundbar versus a surround sound system? <sighs> they can be about the same. Um, it depends on what you buy. So the sound bars, the big thing to know with the sound bars is there's two different types of sound bars. There are sound bars that are purely just stereo, that are literally just stereo speakers in one box. I would say don't do that. If you want stereo, just buy stereo speakers, buy powered stereo speakers. The ones you want are the ones that are doing the actual surround, that are doing the DSP processing to make it sound like surround. Um, you know, companies like Bose are doing, I think Sony's got one. Um, LG had a branded one. There's all, you know, there's all kinds of companies doing these things. Um, so I would say you're going to spend a few hundred dollars for something like that, which is pretty comparable to a, you know, middle class 5.1 setup, you know, with the receiver. Um, obviously the sound bar doesn't come with a receiver, but there's ways to hook it up where you don't necessarily even need a receiver. Um, depending on the sound bar, again, it gets into, you know, kind of too many variables for me to really speak to exactly how you would hook it up in your living room. Um, but I'd see a few hundred bucks. I'm sure there are ones that are more expensive. Uh, I personally wouldn't pay that for them. I would just wait for them to come down. Right. Um, Hold on, I'm trying to sort of put these. So just a couple of comments from David here. Must carry is only for broadcast, and it's more that that they think they that they don't think their users want us. We're not high up in priority, and Iris certainly can talk about this more. And that's in terms of uh, cable and satellite. He was mentioning that uh, regarding that portion. Yeah, it's so the the must carry also included in the must carry thing is the definition of M MVPDs discussion and how we're also not involved in that. So there's a lot more. I'm very much glossing over the legal complexity of it, but the core of it is that our framework as PBS is different from everyone else's framework. So even if I as Kaler you wanted to go down the street because we have Google Fiber in town. I could go down and talk to someone from Google and say, hey, we want to be in YouTube TV. Even if I wanted to, we couldn't sign the agreement to do that the same way, as, say, a local commercial broadcaster could. Um, Brent adds, great presentation. Education is the hurdle to overcome in-house and in the home. Thoughts on how PBS can be the educator on explaining 4K and UHD to members, aligned with the coming soon availability of 4K content via Passport to <coughs> members. Maybe this needs to be engineering, working with marketing and with member services. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't really have anything. Yes, I think I think we we have a very good spot to do a lot of different education for our for our viewers and for our consumers. Um, it, the the trouble with that is making sure you frame it in such a way where you don't then end up down that rabbit hole of everybody's different, every variable is different, every consumer has a different level of of knowledge. Um, so that's a very fine line to walk. But I definitely think that we're in a really good spot to um, to put out some sort of educational materials around that. And I think for those of us who remember the DTV transition, that we did a considerable amount of work on that front um, going forward. And I think in terms of, um, you know, in terms of when we have 4K of material available in Passport, I think that's going to be a huge um, turning point uh, for that service. And um, I, I expect we would do some sort of full court press of educational fronts on, on any number of levels. 
Uh, Bill Hayes writes in, stick your potentially flammable smartphone in a cardboard box and then hold it to your face? I don't think so. <laughs> fair point. So, Absolutely fair point. I just I just thought I'd share that. Um, Bill, I don't think you're supposed to be using those potentially flammable phones. Um in uh, any anymore i think i don't think you can even fly with certain of them anymore um justin asks with all these devices doesn't that create a lot of latency on the home network or controller latency as well as in a game system is cost tossed around a lot so there yes there are latency issues kind of everywhere and we're going to see them more and more um a lot of them are not not going to be huge deals because most people won't notice them. Like, like uh, the big thing that we're going to see with ATSC three is, you know, these tunerless TVs, right? Maybe it doesn't matter that they're tunerless because they talk to your network that then has, say, an LG network box that is the tuner, and then over your internal network, it gets the the signal and plays it. So there's going to be some latency as the signal flies across your network, but you're not going to notice it because you you don't have a point of reference. You're not comparing it to anything. And the latency is going to be low enough so that, you know, say you're watching live sports, it's not going to be high enough latency where you see a goal 10 minutes after everybody else. It's not going to be that high. So most in most situations, um, it's not, there will be latency, but no one will care because it functionally won't matter. Um, it does matter when you're talking about sync audio video. So that's why I mentioned the audio return channel stuff. So anytime you're segmenting processing of audio and video, you have to think about reconciling those two things. Um, if your audio is going one way, video is going another, you've got to think about that latency. TVs are getting better with those latencies. Um, LG's OLED series had terrible latency when it launched, um, but actually it's come down to, I think, around 30 milliseconds, which is pretty solid, um, for an, especially for an OLED TV, um, through firmware updates, through just through firmware updates. So there are the ability, there is the ability for um, companies to fix these things post-launch because these are basically little mini computers, right, that are just getting fed software. Um, so they were able to fix a lot of that stuff. And now the LG, you know, um, B6 and E6 TVs from last year are still really solid buys and are getting a lot cheaper now. And now that they've solved those problems, they're actually usable for gamers, whereas at launch they weren't. Um, controller latency, there's not, you're not really going to see much of that because that's just talking to the the console itself. Um, so that doesn't, that that side of latency doesn't really play into it, but there is a lot of a lot of latency introduced by doing a lot of fancy things. So um, Bill adds that he saw a demo of a soundbar at CES in an A/B comparison with a true surround sound system, and the results were virtually the same. He shared a link with me that I'm going to put out again into the chat. So for those of you who are interested in that. Um, that'll be coming forth. Next question is, why does everyone hate true motion? <laughs> true. So true motion, it's, it's a very, um, personal choice. It's one of those, a lot of us who inherently who have spent our whole careers knowing what certain motion is supposed to look like, knowing what a film motion is supposed to look like versus video motion is supposed to look like versus, you know, these things we, our brains are like, it's wrong. We know when there's a mismatch between what we know as professionals, the content's supposed to look like, and um, what the TV's actually doing. So there, I think that's my, at least personally, why it's so jarring to me. Um, that said, true motion can be awesome for certain stuff, especially sports. Sports is, I think, the the one exception where I would say, you know, I, I most of the time I, I hate true motion. But if I were really big into sports, which I'm not really, um, I can see that being something that would really enhance a sports viewing ex experience. But to have it as a global setting on all the time, I think it just makes everything look weird but again it's a personal preference thing it just happens to be that most of us who do this professionally have a very it's very jarring to us i think because of what we do and because of of what we're used to seeing versus what we're seeing so i know we're running long but we're uh we're i want to make sure we get these questions asked um next question is is there any particular benefit to using a limited surround setup like a 3.1 system over a soundbar um I think you're you're not going to have the processing for a a three like a three point one setup doing the processing properly is not really going to be as good as a soundbar um, because stuff isn't really designed to be processed for that and also all of the the best minds around that DSP processing are working on um, dual speaker source 
uh, virtualization and immersive sound. So everybody who's working on VR, who's working on AR, who's working on um, all this DSP stuff, the best engineers, audio engineers, software engineers, they're working on dual speaker source stuff. So that's where I would put my money where the, the talent is, where the dev talent is. That's my personal opinion on it. Um, I think that no matter what you do, I think having a subwoofer is very important because I think most speakers, even big quote full range speakers, very hard to get um, the same feel, uh, the same just bass response you can get uh, out of a sub. The One of the happiest days of my life was moving out of an apartment into our first house and being able to actually turn up my subwoofer to the point where my wife was downstairs and I was playing a Star Wars game and she said, it sounds like there's a battle going on upstairs. And I said, that's exactly right, because we don't have neighbors <laughs> downstairs anymore. <laughs> yes, it is, it is very liberating. <laughs> so, okay, a couple more. Uh, does Nintendo offer a, an on-demand streaming functionality like Netflix or HBO Go? I don't know, but I don't think so. Um, it's one of those, I am not super familiar with the Nintendo consoles because I don't personally own any, and it's sort of a stretch to get my TV station to buy me a bunch of Nintendo consoles. Um, so, I, yeah, it's not... If they do, it's not significant enough for me to include it in a discussion of consumer behavior at this point. I think we had a Wii for a while, and I don't remember any of that stuff being available on there. It was it was mostly other other things. Um, how far in the future will Sony and Microsoft focus on only 4K and HDR gaming? <sighs> Who knows? Um, it's one of those. Everybody's at a different spot with it, right? Like in America we're just getting into like we're talking about 4k and hdr like they're just over the horizon whereas in japan they're already doing broadcast tests in 16k so it's all over the place in terms of who's where um obviously gaming is a global thing publishing is a global thing um development is a global thing um i think that we have a good long runway of 4k hdr wide color gamut being the the high-end target um, just because of that's, that's again, gets right. Gets back to the, you did the sort of common denominator thing. Um, that's going to be the common denominator. That's going to unite, uh, the U S Europe and, um, Asia is going to be 4k HDR. That's everybody's going to be able to support that. Maybe some stuff in Japan supports more, maybe European satellite broadcasters support more. Um, but everybody will be able to, that's a, that's a good baseline target for a while. Um, and it's going to give a good experience and it's enough of a jump where the marketing people are happy that they can actually sell it. All right. We got, uh, two more and one comment, which the comment is why can't all webinars be this cool? So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Um, got a couple smart TVs, different makers, both have terrible reliability when connected wirelessly. I finally gave up and ran ethernet. Is there any trick to setting up the Wi-Fi in either the sets or the hub? For your smart TV. Um, so in general, the, the bit, best thing to do with Wi-Fi is to scan and force a channel. Don't have auto channels. Um, there are a lot of routers have this functionality. It does take your wireless network down for a few minutes while it does a scan, uh, but it uses its internal antennas and scans for which of the approved Wi-Fi channels are available um, in your area. So if you're if all of your neighbors are on channel 11, you don't want to be on channel 11. Channel 11 is a very congested place to be in your neighborhood. You want to bounce down to something else. Um, so I would recommend doing a scan. If you can't do a scan on your router, there are apps um, on mobile and on desktop um, that you can scan for them. I don't remember the names of them offhand. There's a bunch of them though. Um, just look you know, for Wi-Fi channel scanner and you'll find something. So that's my, my big advice is force on your router you want to force a channel that is uncluttered and once you force it though you've got to every now and then recheck it because maybe you get a bunch of new neighbors they all go to channel six and oh no your channel six is cluttered um so you need to check it every now and then uh beyond that it's the basic you know don't don't have things next to each other um don't uh yeah, don't have microwaves near thing you know I, I doubt your microwaves next to your tv but if it is move it move it away move it away um Stuff like that. You're, bound, you're bound to confuse the two at some point. If <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it's. I would say the the best advice is yeah, run a scan and see what your your um your RF environment looks like and and sort of try to do stuff from there. Also, honestly, some TV stuff is just terrible. Like we've seen in troubleshooting with people, we've seen a lot of 
really poor shielding. We've seen a lot of um, wide spectrum stuff where like a TV tuner is susceptible up to like five gigahertz when it really shouldn't be. So it's getting your Wi-Fi and that's interfering with TV stuff like that. And it's that stuff is really just impossible to troubleshoot because that's a design issue. So there, it, unfortunately, there may be nothing you can do even if you do the, the scanning and the testing. So let's see. Uh, the UHD one capabilities actually approach the limitation of the human visual system. Bill Hayes will have a c column on that in TV Technology in a couple weeks, so you can look forward to that on TV Technology. Um, nice. Bill also asks, "Do you think VR will have much of a future with broadcasters?" One of the chief complaints with 3D was having to wear glasses, and VR requires what is essentially a helmet. Yeah. So VR, <clears throat> I think that VR has a very bright future for very limited applications. Um, the headsets are going to keep getting better and lighter. So eventually we'll get to something where the the trade-off isn't that isn't that bad. Um, I think the big problem with 3D is you had to wear the glasses all the time and you didn't really get much. Like it wasn't really a mind-blowing experience. Whereas when you put someone in a Vive or a Rift and put them in front of that demo where the like there's a so there's a demo, spoilers, there's a demo where a T-Rex walks towards you out of the darkness and then walks over you and you're just looking up at it in VR and it is amazing. And you have that moment of, wow, all right. So that wow moment, I don't think 3D ever got that wow moment. VR does have that wow moment and that's what you need to sell people. That said, I don't know that it has a ton of use cases. So I think we will get headsets that people are willing to wear, um, but the use cases will still be fairly limited. However, augmented reality, I think is the, what's going to be really big for us in broadcast, being able to use um, the the data streams that are inherent to ATSC3 to maybe drive an augmented reality headset. So augmented reality, I actually don't go into this in the presentation. Augmented reality means you're looking at you're looking at your regular stuff. You can see your surroundings, but then stuff comes over them. Like maybe there's overlays. Maybe you look at someone's walking by you with a nice pair of shoes. You look at those shoes, and a little pop up in your vision comes up with here's here's the shoes. They're two ninety nine on Amazon. Want to buy them? That kind of stuff. Marketers are you know going crazy for those use cases, but there's other less markety use cases for it. I can see that being a really big thing for us where you're watching a show and you have this plus overlay, you know, sort of like second screen experience now, but way less disconnect between what's on the screen and that quote unquote second screen experience because it's all within your field of vision. Still does require some form of goggles, still requires you to wear something, at least until we all become cyborgs. Um, but I think again, I think something like that could have enough of a wow factor where people would, would do it and find it valuable. So uh, one last comment before we get into our section, like next section here. Um, for those for those of you working on your uh, smart TV Wi-Fi and, and and connections, don't run your router into a surge protector. It was crazy how it used to drop, and we unplugged it and plugged it straight into the wall. Our problems were solved. So thank you, David, for writing in with that. And that's everything for this segment. Nice. So yeah, that it's stuff like that is. There's always some weird little gotcha with every piece of equipment. And that, that's, I think, the big takeaway. There's always some gotcha. No matter what, no matter how much you know, no matter how much information you have, no matter how much research you put into it, there will always be some gotcha. Um, but also keeps it interesting. So now here's the part where I'm not trying to sell you stuff, but I'm telling you stuff that I bought that I really like. Um, I have no relationships with any of these companies. Uh, I paid full price for all of these things, largely through uh, KLRU, because a lot of this is you know involved in my work, but some of it I also bought personally. Um, and these are so some of, these are some of my favorite things that I use in pro work that are off the beaten path in terms of professional stuff. First is this little guy. Uh, it's from Aver Media. It's the Easy Recorder 130. Um, it's a tiny little box that takes HDMI input and records it encoded H it records uh, an H.264 encoded MP4 to a thumb drive. This is how we record uh, when we do Austin City Limits tapings. When the artist leaves, they need to leave with uh, the whole performance with them so that they can go through and time code and tell us, oh, I like this. Oh, I missed that note. Take that out. Um, give us notes on the show. And they need to walk off with that onto their tour bus. We used to do it on DVDs. It was terrible. So now we do it with this little guy. Show ends. We stop the recording, pull the thumb drive, hand it to artists. They're on the bus. They're gone. They've got an HD quality 
uh, with timecode. The timecode burn-in, we do upstream of it, so it doesn't do that sort of stuff internally. Um, but it's just a super simple little device. It has one button on it. Uh, once you set it up, it just sits there, and when you hit record, it records whatever's coming into it. Um, obviously, with the exception of content-protected stuff, which none of our stuff is because it comes out of our studio. So super useful little box uh, if you need to do H.264 recording straight to a thumb drive. This guy, so Monoprice, Monoprice used to have a bad name in the pro world, um, but they're actually doing some solid stuff now. And this is one of two Monoprice devices that's on my list. This is their SDI to HDMI converter. Not only does it convert SDI to HDMI, that SDI out that you're seeing right there is a true reclocked SDI out. So if you're at the end of an SDI run, if you're you know getting to 300 whatever feet, starting to drop off, plug into this guy, reclock, send it another whatever. And we've actually tested this in our facility where we ran a signal around the facility back to the patch bay, plugged into this guy, reclocked it, sent it around the facility again, was solid for hours. Thing didn't overheat, thing whatever, it's all good. Um, so nice little box, it's under 100 bucks. I think it's down to like 60 something now, it's crazy. Um, and it's just super useful. Also really useful that you don't have to buy an SDI monitor to monitor an SDI signal. Stick this thing on the back, HDMI out to, you know, whatever Vizio TV or whatever you picked up at Walmart and you're good to go. This guy, I love this guy. This is, I was turned on to this by that uh, rating site. Um, this is a latency tester. So all it is is a button and on the other side, there's a photo sensor and it's got an HDMI out. So you plug it into a display, push the button, put the photo sensor over the blinking square, like you see this guy's doing, and it tells you what the latency is between when the signal leaves the box and when it's displayed on the TV. Super, super useful if you have an audio mix room that is monitoring on a TV, or really even on a just regular monitor. Um, so you can dial in, if you're dialing in like an audio delay, you can dial it in perfectly and have your monitoring in sync and then nobody gets mad. Um, got a lot of other uses too, but I love this little guy. It's super useful. This guy's super expensive, so nobody's probably going to buy this guy, but I felt the need to mention it because this is a HDMI signal generator and analyzer kit. Really expensive, but amazing if you're like me doing a bunch of work on consumer side, on the consumer technology side and on consumer interconnects. Um, it tells you, it, this is the device that uh, on that page where I was showing you what comes out of the Xbox, those screens were taken from this device. So it tells you what the HDR metadata is, what the bit depth is, what the uh, bandwidth is, all that stuff. It can do cable testing, it can generate signals, it can generate Dolby Vision signals. Lots of cool stuff, super useful for testing. This is a new one that I just discovered. This is a full 444 HDMI matrix. So four in, four out, you can route anything to anything, and it actually passes all the way up to 10 gigabit, um, or sorry, 18 gigabit uh, HDMI signals. So all the way up to the top of that uh, HDMI 2.0 spec on that chart I showed you. Super useful if you've got a bunch of really high bandwidth signals that you need to route around quickly, like say, if you're doing a bunch of testing. That's it for my picks. So uh, if you've got any other questions you thought of or any questions on devices or want to throw out any other weird consumer devices, um, now's the time. Yep, uh, don't have anything just yet, but what I will do while we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions is um, our next webinar in Dwayne or Wayne Piscina's series, rather, IP Networking for the Broadcast Professional, will be on Wednesday, June 21. So if you'd be interested in that, I will post the link for it um, in the chat screen. As well, um, I will post the slide deck and recording in mypbs.org slash technews, where you can find uh, previous webinars and previous issues of the Tech News newsletter. Um, those old issues will also include ways for you to uh, subscribe to the newsletter if you want to get it directly sent to your email. Um, David writes in, great presentation. How about a consumer level one that we can brand as PBS nationally, invite our viewers and members to, to see? Great job. Oof. I had, a, I had a hard time dumbing this one down enough. I took a lot out of this one. Um, I think there's definitely value in it, but it, it would be very difficult to, to 
shape that kind of de- kind of presentation. Secondary problem with it is, um, like I mentioned, this stuff changes so fast. Um, so this presentation I give now in June is different than the one I gave in April is different than the one I gave in May. Um, so it's an, an ongoing update process and it's, it's very difficult to keep up with that. So I think we would have to really think about, um, what the end goal is and work backwards, right? Like what the, the, um, minimum viable amount of, uh, questions we need to answer with it and see if we can do it in a way that doesn't require updating every three weeks. That's a good one. <laughs> David also wrote back in, ouch, that was dumbed down. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. See, Bill, yeah, it's, uh, it was funny. Like you saw Bill Hayes kind of sneaking in higher level stuff. Like Bill is sneaking in the real pro level stuff. This is like sort of prosumer level but bill yeah bill was kind of jumping in on the side with the real the, the true pro stuff which i did try to avoid a bit because we'd be here for days if we go down the rabbit hole the the technical level of the stuff i was talking about yeah we we kind of do that at uh tech con and i thank you both for um for help helping us bring the tech to tech con uh brent adds in uh on that topic hmm one minute interstitial 4k hdr education spots for air would be handy (laughs) um bart writes in do you see a viable future for ps now sony's backwards compatibility service that streams or xbox one's backwards compatibility where you can just put your 360 uh, original xbox discs in the x1 the superior way to do backwards compatibility (laughs) so this actually gets to the latency thing because this is a use case that I actually didn't mention is that as we as a country build out infrastructure and build out you know broadband and all that to places that don't have broadband um, some of these interactive things that we're doing locally that we're doing in our living rooms solely contained in our living rooms like gaming are going to move to the cloud um, and that's what PS Now is so PS Now is Sony's service where you play games but you don't actually have them locally. You're streaming them. Basically your input is streaming to Sony's cloud and it's controlling, you know, a street fighter or whatever. And then the frames are streaming back to you. Obviously latency is incredibly important in that situation. And nobody's really gotten it um, performing to where I would say it is comparable to a local experience. So I think that's going to be something that if we get into as content providers, if we start getting into really complex IP layer stuff that, um, requires interactivity, we're going to hit a latency wall real fast um, and run into problems with it. Um, to the backwards compatibility thing, that's also some in, uh, something interesting that I didn't put in here, but there was a study recently that um, even though these manufacturers are putting backwards compatibility, like, oh, I can play old games or I can play old, you know, even DVDs or, you know, older stuff, legacy stuff. Most people don't actually go back. And it's like, single digit percentage of consumers who go back to old, old content, old games, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's really important to, to think about and to be involved in that conversation of when we're designing systems and talk about how backwards compatible, uh, compatible do we need to be with what came before, realize that most people might say they care, but in practice don't actually care and don't actually use it. Kenneth writes in with a couple comments that I thought I'd get your reaction to. Uh, Number one is that Apple TV carries PBS channels. And number two is that a consumer program versus a consumer webinar might be more appropriate. Show how to take a consumer set and make it sound better. Just adding computer speakers to a 24-inch monitor makes it sound awesome compared to the stock tiny speakers. Very true. And that that gets back to targeting, right? Is what, what do we want... What do we want people to come away with? What are the problems we need to solve for for regular consumers? And then how do we best solve them in a way that can serve the broadest audience? And that's the, I don't necessarily have the answer to that question, um, but that's the big question of, of that we need to answer before we start deciding, hey, let's produce this, that, and the other thing in terms of educational resources. I think I've got the perfect question to end on, which is... All right. How many cats were edited out of the presentation? <laughs> so I, I am pseudo famous for putting cats into presentations. Um, I had 14 on an internal presentation once. Um, this presentation was so dense and required so much editing that I actually wasn't able to put that many cats in it. So I got these two. I had grumpy cat earlier and that was kind of it. So I, that's, that's my biggest failure in this presentation is not, not many cats. And I apologize uh, to everyone for that. 
Uh, and a suggestion has come in that says add dogs. Add no, no dogs. That's that's the other presentation. That's not me. That's everything we've got, Chris. Sweet. Um, so I'll put up the very last slide, which is if you come up with questions later, um, you can email me or you can yell at me on Twitter uh, or both, whichever. Um, it's all good. And then Kevin's got the, did you put out the, the handout, Kevin? Oh yeah, let me, I will do that right now, actually. We've got a got PDF. There, we've got a PDF coming for you. Hold on, let me figure out how to get both of these screens online. Um, yeah, coming up. So, um, find it, PDF, 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 here it is. TechCon living room coming your way. So those of you who are still online here with us at the tail end, so to speak. Man, I thought, yeah, I thought we gave it enough time, more than enough. No, no. It's, the questions are really good, though. I appreciate it. I'm glad everyone had questions. Thank you for asking your questions. Yep. Uh, Bill adds that I thought it was perfect. <laughs> thank and, you, Bill. Uh, Justin, Justin adds, very informative and helpful. So th Chris, thank you again for updating your TechCon presentation. Uh, Heath writes in, you are a true hashtag PBS nerd <laughs> as well. So some good feedback there. Thanks, everybody, for sticking this out. I know we've, we've run a little long. Um, I will have this posted up on my PBS tomorrow. Um, so for those people, if you know anybody who missed it, who would like this sort of thing, and uh, they can get the uh, handout and the recording at mypbs.org slash technews sometime tomorrow morning. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Chris, do you have anything else before we sign off? That's it. Thank you, everybody. If you come up with anything else, hit me up. Always happy to talk. All right. Thank you all for joining us. That is the end of today's webinar. And drive safely. Bye.